the ability to prioritize, being comfortable with a certain level of ambiguity. That's that's very important. Business of Architecture, episode 404. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm speaking with Nelson Worldwide Vice President and Industrial Practice Leader, Balmiki Bhattacharya. Balmiki heads Nelson's industrial practice from their office in Seattle, where he's responsible for integrating design programs, maximizing operations and investments, and also helping create a strategic, sustainable plan for the firm's future. Now, Mickey has had a very distinguished career with over two decades of experience in different leadership positions, working at several organizations, including MG2, Calliston RTKL, the Talbum Company, and Starbucks before joining Nelson. In this episode, Bal Mickey provides insight on how a large practice like Nelson operates and the mechanisms that they have in place in terms of operations and business development. He also talks about the many hats he wears as practice leader and the skills was essential in making that leap into a leadership position. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Bao Mickey Bhattacharya. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Balmiki, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. My absolute pleasure. Now, you are based in Seattle. You're the current vice president of Nelson Worldwide. You've had a very impressive career. You Previously before Nelson, you were MG2 Design. Um, you've worked for the Talbum Company. Is that right? Talbum and Company, yep. yeah. Talbum and Company. Um, and you were the founder principal of B2 Design Works, also in, in Seattle. Yes, you've had a, um, a very distinguished career. You've been involved in a number of leadership positions in these different um, practices. Uh, how did your position as vice president at Nelson, how did that emerge? All right. Um, so maybe I'll take a step back and just kind of quickly uh, walk through my career progression. Mm-hmm. So I uh, was born and raised in India, got my undergrad degree in architecture in India, uh, came to the United States about 25 years ago for my graduate degree, and I've been practicing in the U.S. for the last 23 years, mostly in Seattle, spent some time in Michigan. Um, I would say over the years, you know, as I've discovered more about the profession of architecture, my interests have changed and evolved, and I've seeked out kind of uh, new opportunities. Um, So I joined Nelson uh, about six months ago, so I'm fairly new to Nelson. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I lead the industrial practice for Nelson. Uh, So Nelson is a multi-practice architectural firm. Uh, We are just over 700 people. I think we have about 16 different offices, and there are about eight different practice areas. And uh, industrial happens to be one of the practice areas. Uh, There are other practice areas such as retail, mixed use, healthcare, uh, so on and so forth. How, how old is Nelson as a company? Nelson, uh, I believe the firm was started in 1977. Okay. Um, and it was started mostly as a corporate interiors firm. And over the years through several acquisitions, it has become more of like a multi-sector architectural design firm. Right. So, um, it's grown then to a 700 person strong business, which in architecture terms is a pretty large practice. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And as you, as you say, it's kind of multi, multi offices. Is the Seattle office, that's the headquarters? No, the headquarters is in Minneapolis. Uh, Seattle, right. I would say, is one of the uh, smaller offices. Uh, mm-hmm. We are, I think, around 40 people right now in Seattle. Uh, there are some offices which are much larger, such as uh, Atlanta, Boston, Philadelphia, and others. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. And and what does your role entail? What does it mean to be the vice president? Is that vice president of the entire group or vice president of the Seattle office? So it's, uh, let's see, um, 
So the vice president is just a title. Uh, yeah. Certain people with certain level of responsibility have the vice president title at Nelson, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my role is to lead the uh, industrial practice for the whole firm across all 16 or 18 offices. I see. Um, okay. So the industrial practice itself, uh, as I said, is one of the uh, eight or nine practices. Uh, it's... Uh, The Seattle office is a large hub of the industrial practice. There are three hubs of the industrial practice, uh, Seattle, Atlanta, and New York. And we cover the entire country in terms of industrial uh, architecture from one of these three offices. So that's quite an interesting way of of how the business is structured then, that it's actually building typologies, which are, are the kind of main strands of the business. So it's not location necessarily, but it's the head of the industrial sector. If you like, yep. is that uh, is that how the business has always been structured, or did that kind of hierarchy emerge recently? Um, you know, I think as the firm size has grown, uh, the structure of the business has changed. Uh, at some point in time, we were like a regional uh, based practice, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but uh, I think uh, I think. Um, Having a practice vertical in many ways makes sense. It it helps build on expertise, mm-hmm. um, and um, so one can kind of think of um, the regions as uh, the sales and delivery organizations, and then you have like the practice as the center of uh, center of knowledge and innovation. Got it. So within the Seattle office, for example, how many different practices exist? There are about three or four practices that exist uh, in the Seattle office. Uh, but uh, um, as I mentioned, industrial is, 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 is a dominant practice in okay. the Seattle office. And, and, and what, are, what are the other practices that kind of co, coexist? And is there a lot of, are they really separate entities or they're very much integrated with each other? No, it's fairly integrated with with uh, uh, each other, you know. So some of the other practices are hospitality, corporate interiors, and some asset strategy work. Brilliant. That, that's that's very very interesting. Um, and how is the organizational structure of Nelson work? So is there a main CEO at the top, and then there's yep. the kind of C level of executives, like a number of different vice presidents of each of the different practices. And how does it how does yeah. it work as a structure yeah. when so we get? We to have that uh, at the very top we have CEO, COO, and CFO. Okay. And then there are all the national practice leads, about eight or nine of us. Um, and then under the national practice leads, we have regional practice leads. So I have a regional practice lead in each one of the regions that the industrial practice is in. Um, and then kind of, uh, then under the regional practice leads are the account leaders and senior project managers, technical directors, so on and so forth. Got it. And how, how does somebody then become vice president? Cause we often think about these roles as, you know, Either someone who's nurtured from the from the grassroots levels, like a, in a, in an academy in a sports team type type of thing, yeah. Or was it was it headhunting, or how how did how did the opportunity how did the how did your career develop into that position? Yeah. So um, I came in from the outside. I was right. with another uh, firm here in town. I was recruited to Nelson, mm-hmm. um, but my. Uh, but the position became available because the previous national practice lead, um, uh, she retired. Um, and um, so Kathy Kraft was the previous national practice lead and Nelson had acquired her firm a couple of years ago. Right. Uh, and then, uh, so that, that kind of seeded the industrial practice in Seattle. And then uh, when she was getting ready to retire, you know, like Nelson launched national search and it was just, it was like pure coincidence that Kathy was in Seattle. I was also in Seattle. Uh, but um, I mean, I believe Nelson was lo- looking for the right candidate uh, uh, anywhere in the country, wherever Nelson has an office. Great. And, and what do you think are some of the skill sets that are required in this kind of position, which are different from being a regular architect, if you like? 
Yeah. So as a practice lead, the role is primarily focused on uh, strategy and vision for the practice. Mm -hmm. it, it is less about the day-to-day -day tactical uh, nature of project execution. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I do get involved in projects also, uh, but the focus is more on setting the tone, uh, making sure at, at a regional level, there's right kind of uh, um, organization structure, the teams have right kind of support. Um, so the role has a couple of elements. So there's a leadership element, there is, there is a business development element, uh, there's a PNL management element uh, and uh, cross collaboration between other practices and other offices of Nelson. Um, so I, I think it's it's you know um, it it goes far beyond just pure architectural knowledge. It's having a general awareness of what's happening in the industry, ability to ask right questions. Uh, I may not always have the answer, uh, so I tend to surround myself with people who know a lot yeah. more than I do, um, and making sure that the team around me has the answer. Brilliant. Um, so could you explain to us a little bit then about this? So the, the, the role is really one of um, focusing on the strategy and vision of Nelson as a, as a group in, in, in large, and also, I'm assuming, digesting what's happening with the CEO's strategy and vision and making sure that there's an alignment with the with the Seattle and the industrial practice. What what sorts of things does the strategy and vision include? Well, um, you know, there are a couple of things we focus on. So people, mm -hmm. uh, making sure we have uh, the right kind of people at right levels of the organization, their right skill set, mm -hmm. uh, making sure we are working with the right kind of clients. Um, uh, making sure we are growing the business in a meaningful way, yeah. uh, not not focused purely on revenue, but uh, revenue, profitability, margins, um, all those things combined. Um, so yeah, so it's it's kind of like a multi multi prong approach, I would say, um, and also just kind of having a good pulse of what's happening in the industrial sector and where the growth opportunities are, who we should be chasing, right. uh, building those relationships. Some of these things take um, a while to kind of build those network and convert a lead to a uh, lead to an actual project. You know? Would you better give us an example or, or a bit of a synopsis, if you like, of what that sales cycle entails in terms of your activities. So if you, if you get a bit of intelligence, where does that intelligence comes from to regarding a new project? And then what would be the strategy of execution to follow up with that relationship? What, is, what does it look like? Sure. So broadly speaking, you know, you have two channels, you have right. existing client, clients and new clients uh, you're pursuing. So um, with uh, existing clients, you know, making sure um we are closely connected with them, not at a project level, but also just kind of talking to them regularly, constant communication, and just understanding what's going on in their business mm -hmm. and making sure that our client groups, whether existing or future, always views us as a thought partner more than a service provider. Uh, because that, that ensures we are at the table earlier. Um, and in most cases, we help our clients actually formulate the projects. Um, so within the industrial, oh, so, sorry, were you going to say something? No, 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 right? no not at all. I'm, I'm not, not talking. I'm interested. Okay. So um, in most cases, I would say, um, uh, so, so within the industrial practice, we do a few types of projects. So the first category would be, uh, the speculative ground up new built projects. Mm -hmm. um, the second category would be built to suit uh, projects, which are for a specific client with a specific use in mind. And the third category would be a variety of tenant improvements. Now, um, and when you think of industrial, many people just immediately go to, uh, you know, warehouses and distribution center. That's that's one piece of industrial, but there's so much more, you know, there's, um, there's manufacturing, there's agricultural, there are other logistics. Um, so warehouses is, is a big part of it, but there's a lot more to that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, I, I mean, I would say that having those early interactions with our client community, making sure that we are at the table early, helping them formulate the project, making sure uh, we are helping them select the right site, mm-hmm. um, uh, ensures we, we are adding true value to the project and not just uh, being, you know, like a mere service provider. That's I, I love this, the, the, the fact that actually you made a distinction between being a talk partner and a service provider and actually to get in early on the project because we, we all know when we see institutions and large corporates, if they go to competition or, uh, competition or an open bid, the, the, often the complaint from many architect practices is like, ah, this is too late almost. You know, yes, and I think, you know, um, un- unless and until one makes that distinction between a service provider and a top partner, mm-hmm. um, it becomes kind of like a uh, issue of fees and that's that leads to kind of like a race to the bottom yeah. and no, uh, nobody really wants to be there you know um so yes there are some industry and practice standards as to uh, what a reasonable fee is for a certain project mm-hmm. uh but if if somebody can articulate as to what else uh, they can bring to the table other than what is expected um, that's that's where we feel we add true value. Got it. So this relationship as a talk partner, um, and you said you know some of the things that you might be doing is helping a client find a site and perhaps giving them some operational strategic advice on what they're doing with their physical assets and and and, and things like that. Are these packaged as services in in and of themselves, or do you write them off as kind of business development expenses where you're not, you're not charging for the advice or how does it, how does it work from a standpoint, from a financial standpoint? So it's, yeah. So it's a little bit of both, Ryan, you know, um, in some cases we, uh, we have kind of like an early engagement contract with a client mm-hmm. where we are uh, helping them in what's called like pre-development services, where we are helping their real estate team find the right site, doing various site plans to make sure that the program, um, they want to fit works. Um, and also understanding um, what success means for the client because uh, that is really important to know. And sometimes like the definition of success differs from stage to stage, to stage of the project, you know. Uh, so understanding that and then making sure that we are delivering uh, to help our clients succeed. You know? Great. And how, how do you identify these opportunities or potential clients what sort of intelligence do you need to be curating and collecting and when what's the kind of process that that nelson would go through to establish that sure. so nelson has a uh, strong internal business development uh, group which is backed by our marketing team so they are constantly looking uh, for what uh, opportunities are out there uh, within a given sector um, all across the country and um, so they are kind of like <clears throat> Uh, uh, the the first round of like recon, you know, yeah. and then um, our team meets with them on like a regular cadence, and we talk to them, find out what they are hearing, and then um, uh, based on who has what kind of relationship within the organization, we start kind of like a reach out campaign, um, and then slowly those leads start to convert to real project, and in some cases, you know, it takes months, years, yeah. Uh, but once you have built up a healthy body of work, uh, sometimes those timelines can be reduced significantly. What, what, what kind of, what's the scale of some of the business development teams in relation to the sort of delivery teams? How, how many people roughly? Do you- uh, so, so, so the business development team is a, so the, the internal BD team at Nelson is fairly small. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the, so there are business development partners who are paired up with a national practice lead. I see. So, so I work with one individual or maybe two uh, yeah. who are finding leads all across the country. And then um, once we have a strong lead, we establish contact. And then I will work with our marketing team to come up with a specific marketing campaign to convert that client. You know, So that may involve... Uh, first reaching out via phone, uh, doing, you know, like a broad presentation, then meeting in person, then understanding 
um, what their upcoming pipeline looks like, how it could uh, be a possible match to like Nelson's skill set. And at the end of the day, you know, like we want to make sure it's a right match because sometimes we may come across a client who are in a growth mode, but maybe what, what they are doing is not a good match for Nelson's current skill set. Yes. So we will not engage there, but maybe when the right project comes along, we'll re-engage with them again. Brilliant. So d- does this mean that uh, this kind of process actually works well and allows Nelson to move into new sectors? And h- how, how would that work if Nelson wanted to move into new sectors? Or is that something that from a business strategy point, you're like, actually, you know what, we've got a number of specialisms, we're, we're sticking to these, it's too risky to move into other. So so when you say new sector, you mean like a new building type? Yeah. Um, that. That's a, that can be done in multiple ways. You know, like Nelson has uh, done that through acquisition of firms, through acquisition of talent, and, um, and then some of that through organic growth. You know, um, I mean, I would say it, it, it's, it's very hard to get into a new sector unless and until you've shown that you can be successful there. You know, yeah. every client wants to see uh, your past success. Um, so yeah, that's that's a slow process, I would say. And as I said, it it happens primarily through those three channels. You know, acquisition of firms, acquisition of talent, and and in some rare cases, organic growth. You know? Got it. Got it. Well, that's very, that again. That's very fascinating. The, the the acquisition of another of another company who has that specialists skill set and the specialist talent and it's almost like they're ready to go they they've been delivering it has that happened recently with with nelson those kinds of acquisitions and are you yeah so nelson um, over the year yeah nelson over the uh, years have grown through acquisition i don't know the exact number but i think we have acquired over 40 firms over the years amazing Uh, and so, in fact, the Seattle industrial practice is a result of one of the uh, one of such acquisitions. Uh, so Kraft Architects uh, was a major industrial architectural firm in Seattle and Nelson acquired um, Kraft Architects, I believe, in 2017. Uh, so that kind of founded uh, or formed the basis of industrial practice in Seattle. Um, and similarly, in, in the Atlanta market, Nelson had acquired another uh, firm, uh, which formed the foundation of the uh, industrial practice and few other practices also in the Atlanta market. What's the, what's the process for an acquisition that, the, that Nelson will, will go through? Again, in terms of, number one, identifying a business that would be suitable for acquisition. And then how do you yeah. mitigate the risk? What sorts of things are you looking for to... Because um, it's it's, it's it, you know that the world of buying architecture firms is a very specialist purchase and something, yeah. something that you you need to be you need to know what you're doing. Yeah, it's it's a it's a long slow process. I myself have not been part of um, uh, any of uh, any of the acquisition process uh, at Nelson like because we because we haven't acquired any firm in the last four years. I would say, right? Um, but you know, it's it's based on. Uh, a firm's presence in a given market, uh, their dominance uh, in a certain sector, if they have have a dominance, mm-hmm. uh, people, uh, book of clients, um, and their finances. You know, because at the end of the day, when you uh, when you acquire a firm, you're you're basically um, getting people and their client list and their debt. Yeah. Uh, so if that. Um, if 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 all those three matrices work with with the current business model, it would be a good candidate for acquisition. Otherwise, maybe not. Do you need to be careful in terms of um, like strategic alignment, values, mission alignment, those kind of like the, like a cultural alignment, really? Yes, and that that takes time. You know, typically uh, there's an integration plan in place prior to an acquisition. And it's a multi-tiered integration plan, and it takes years. Um, right. I would say the cultural integration is the hardest, mm-hmm. um, and because there are um, firms which were you know like a single founder firm or uh, you know like a handful of uh, partners who founded and owned that firm for a long time and then they get acquired and they are they become part of a larger Nelson organization and it's it's a 
it's a cultural shift. And uh, sometimes it's hard for the team to adjust to that. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would say some, some, some organizations do better. Um, others struggle for like a long time. I, I, I can imagine that, you know, a company like Nelson would have a very um, rigorous set of disciplines and systems that perhaps a lot yeah. of architecture firms might not have and might be quite unaccustomed to. Yes. And I think from a, that, that's one of the huge positives, um, a firm that is being recently acquired that, yeah. that experiences is all the support structure and the operational efficiencies which are there in the background you know because in a small firm most people are used to wearing multiple hats yeah. and when you're part of a larger firm it's uh, irrespective of where you are your role is more specialized you know um, so yeah so it does free up more bandwidth uh, uh, to do real architecture and not uh, and not send uh, uh, um, uh, invoices let's say <laughs> brilliant so, so from the how, how does the how do all the different teams and the different practice leaders how do they kind of make sure that they're aligned with the CEO's vision? How does the company kind of uh, ensure that everyone's operating in alignment and you haven't got a rogue practice kind of doing their own thing? Or does that happen? Um, no, I mean, I would say we are we are fairly well aligned. So it starts mm -hmm. with kind of like um, a so so our 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 business year is you know January to December. So we mm -hmm. start the process in October November of like the previous year to start creating the vision and the and the strategic plan for the following year, uh, mm -hmm. where where the C suite meets with basically all the practice leads and creates um, a, a overall business plan for the Nelson organization, as well as practice business plans. And then from that point on, uh, there are frequent meetings, you know, like quarterly meetings, monthly meetings, where we continuously fine tune those. Mm -hmm. um, and then usually sometime first week of January, like those practice plans are set in place and we know what we're marching towards for the whole year. You know? Right. And, and how often are they reviewed? Um, so, so there is a formal review every quarter, uh, but there is an informal review every month. I mean, um, I have weekly touch bases with my CEO and COO. Um, so we go, we, we go over the state of biz, business on like a weekly basis. Okay. Fantastic, and and you, you mentioned there as well part of the, the your your role or one of the sort of things that you're overseeing. You know, you said leadership, um, business development, and 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 finances, and I, and I would assume that the meetings that you have with your with the CEO and the CEO, there are a number of metrics that that everyone's reporting back. What what sorts of things do you guys keep a close eye on to make sure that you know that you're on track for your mission and that you're you're going to be maintaining optimal business health? Sure. So th there are, you know, like BD matrix, uh, operational matrix and financial metrics. Now, um, so um, on, on like the BD front, you know, making sure we are, uh, we are making progress in terms of chasing down or, or like in terms of like pursuing the right clients, mm -hmm. uh, operations, you know, making sure um, uh, our staff utilization rate is where it needs to be. Um, uh, we, we are, we are um, delivering on our contracts and not, uh, uh, not allowing scope creep, you know, uh, making sure that our team really understands what they have to deliver, mm -hmm. um, and like financial, you know, making sure that uh, the um, uh, account receivables are kept to a minimum and uh, billing is being done on time, and uh, you know, just like any other practice, like managing cash flow is 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 a big thing um, when you're running a business. So. Uh, you know, architecture practice, if we look at the year, typically there, there's a spike in the summer. Uh, so understanding how the year will look in terms of a cash flow and managing the business to that cash flow 
is very important. Um, right. Same thing uh, towards the end of the year as we are trying to close our books, making sure we are we are fully paid up. No. So, yeah. what, what what kind of transparency does Nelson do you have at Nelson with say with the project architects and the delivery team and the financials of the business so you know how, how do you manage that interface you know w- b- between knowing how many hours being worked on the project what it equates to in terms of the fee that's left in there yeah so when it comes to contracts and finances Nelson is very transparent you know nice. so our our contracts are mostly created by the project managers and the account leaders. So they write the contract. It, it may be reviewed by others, um, uh, but it is up to the project managers and the project team to write the contract. So they know they, they are fully empowered um, in terms of uh, um, what it will take to kind of deliver the project. And, we, we have um, different tools we use to uh, do diff- different back checks, you know, work planning tools, other, um, um, other financial projection tools, which, which tells us, you know, uh, how we would do with a certain kind of fee. Um, and then um, every week, um, we, we look back as to how the last week was, you know, what we projected and how we did. And then, so, so on, on a weekly basis, we have a look back and a look ahead. Um, so that, that really helps us ensure we stay on track. Uh, because sometimes with, uh, with smaller projects, it's hard to recoup a misstep, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a little easier with larger, longer duration projects, but we have a mix, mix of both. You mm-hmm. know? So one way I kind of uh, um, explain my team is, um, you know, let's just assume that Nelson's standard profitability target is 10%. Okay. So if we make a $10,000 mistake, it will take us $100,000 of new work to make up for that $10,000 mistake. Mm-hmm. So it's hundred thousand dollars worth of work which we hadn't planned for. So we have to go out and get another hundred thousand dollars worth of new work to make up for that ten thousand yeah. dollars. Yes, right. Great. Um, th- this is very, very insightful about how the business operates and like the kind of mechanisms that you have in place and how a large practice like this works. From a employee standpoint, as they as as they progress in their careers what sort of training do they need to go through to say to make that leap from being project architect project manager to move up into leadership positions what sorts of business acumen do does nelson help them acquire or do you see that's fundamental for their success as uh, you know kind of moving out of say a traditional design role and being more involved in the business what's that what's the kind of career path like if you yeah, so Nelson in general is a very entrepreneurial um, entrepreneurial organization. Mm-hmm. You know, there really aren't any limits put on anybody as to what you can or cannot do. Yeah, um, I would say traditionally there are three paths. You know, design, technical, and project management. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there are, you know. Um, several like professional development programs in place, which, which allows our teammates to, uh, to, to, to like progress within those defined paths. But uh, other than that, you know, I mean, outside of that, if somebody has a specific interest, um, they can always talk to their managers and leaders and, uh, and, you know, shadow somebody uh, and work with that person and learn a new skill set. Let's say if somebody is really interested in like business development, yeah. Um, can they can easily team up with somebody and kind of um, learn the ropes there. Um, same thing with project management. Um, or if somebody has a keen interest in general operations, you know, um, that's a uh, that's also a very important skill set in a large organization like ours is just having a good understanding of how how we office or how a region uh, works within our organization. You know? So I, I think the general uh, 
skill set we look for in a person is a certain curiosity, inquisitiveness, uh, willingness to ask questions, mm-hmm. uh, willingness to try and fail, um, and and kind of learn from those failures. Great. In in terms of business development, um, how do you help people kind of get involved in in that? Because that can often be quite a foreign um, part of the part of the business sometimes it's a person it can be quite personality driven some people are much more open to getting on the phone and speaking to strangers other people that idea makes them crawl under the bed covers if you like yeah yeah and and uh, no well like uh i mean like you're spot on like some people are just built for that mm-hmm. you know so um uh, ability to walk up to some, somebody and talk uh willing to be uncomfortable you know mm-hmm. Uh, and some people are just good at networking. Um, And uh, so I think it just kind of um, one's desire has to kind of match with, uh, uh, with, with their personality, you know? Mm. Uh, So, yeah, but most of the time they're paired up with somebody who has been doing this for a while and they kind of learn through that. Great. Great. Uh in in terms of your leadership, um, what have been some of the big lessons or the things that you've had to develop as a as, as skill sets that perhaps you didn't have before, or perhaps there were natural strengths that you had, and that you've you've really had to lean into those. You didn't realize that they were such an asset when you met perhaps early on in your career. What? Yeah. So, you know, I would say that after. Um, the first 10 years of uh, my professional career, I kind of made a, a switch. I went uh, from working on the architectural consulting firm side to owner side, and that gave me a whole new perspective because when I was on the consulting firm side, um, I uh, felt I was in a very reactive mode mm. and I felt like I was always uh, reacting to decisions that were already made by the client. Yeah, and uh, once I made made the transition to the owner side, I realized that uh, um, I I had a little bit more ability to influence certain decisions, um, and so I think just seeing how architectural decisions are made on the owner side was very important, and you kind of learn quickly that it's not just about uh, design and construction, but there are you know, that's, that's probably one tenth of, uh, of the decisions, you know? Um, so that, that gave me a whole new perspective. I think, um, working with different kind of owners and how they make decisions. So I've worked for, uh, for retailers, I've worked for developers and I have worked as like an owner's rep and all those different roles on the owner side taught me different things. Oh, wow. And when I came back to the architectural firm side, I was uh, equipped to be a better leader mm. because I had all these other experiences. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's um, it's just um, time and learning from all those experiences. I think to, think to a certain extent, we are all accidental experts in some way. We don't really plan out to you know, be an expert in something, you know, but um, over the years, the other big, big realization I've had is, you know, I make probably less, less number of decisions on a given day or a given week, but they're more, more critical decision. Uh, So that has also influenced my leadership style. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, so I I think like the best way I can describe this is, uh, early in one's career, you know, you're in a soccer field with 100 balls and you're just kicking away. And as, as long as you're getting 90 or 95 into the goal, you know, you're doing great. Uh, yeah. But later on in your career, you're in a soccer field with three balls. And those are, those are very important balls. And you can take a little longer. But when you make, make that kick, it has to go into the goal. How, uh, how, how did you know what to not do or the things to let go of? So that, that's, again, you know, uh, understanding what is important at, at a given point in time, yeah. uh, because um, I think architects uh, by nature are, are 
very perfection. You know, I mean, like uh, architects by nature tend to be perfectionist. Mm -hmm. They they take a huge pride in their work, so it's very hard to let go. Um, but uh, it's almost like if you care about everything, you care about nothing. So on a given day, you have to pick what is important and focus on that. You know. Uh, so yeah. So just the ability to prioritize. Uh, being comfortable with a certain level of ambiguity, that's that's very important. You know, uh, uh, we may not have have the answers to the questions right now. You know, the answer may slowly appear, but just being just the willingness to be comfortable with that uncertainty is 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 very important. Yeah, brilliant. Um, you were mentioning there. Uh, about you spent some time in your career on the owner's rep side um, mm-hmm. and doing these other these other um, positions. What were some of the specific things that you learned, particularly on that in that owner's rep side, for example, that you, that have really made you a, a better architect, a better leader, and understand a client? You know, what what are the sorts? Of, and I suppose the, another way of asking this question is, what sorts of things do we as architects miss out or are not listening to? Yeah, so um, so I'll speak to my experience on on like the developer side because mm-hmm. I think that was uh, most uh, impactful and valuable. I think um, one thing you learn very quickly on like the developer side is that in many cases the answer is given, but what matters is the journey. You know. Right. Uh, and how, how many friends you make and bridges you build along that journey. Yeah. You know? um, the, the second thing is um, um, understanding what, what success means at each stage. Um, how a project is funded, because source of funding uh, defines success in many ways. Mm. Um, and understanding what is... Uh, the architect's role in that particular phase to help the client succeed. You know? yes. um, I, I think some of the other things is that, you know, at a certain level, the owner has the freedom to choose probably one of three or five architects. And from a technical execution point of view, any one of those choices could be fine. But mm-hmm. typically the owner goes with one as opposed to the others is because there's a strong chemistry uh, in terms of pers- in terms of team personality and um, you know because most of these larger projects will last a long time you know you'll be traveling with this person or with this team frequently you'll get to know them you'll get to know their kids you know so it's just who do you enjoy working with yeah. that that is a big part of like the decision making process I would say. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, it's kind of hard for me to come up with a list of what I learned on the owner side, but it does, uh, it has given me a much more broader perspective. Mm -hmm. It has given me, uh, the ability to ask questions, which I would not have asked before. You know, uh, like an example would be like that. How is a project funded? Yeah. And how does that impact, uh, how an architectural firm engages with you. That's, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. Well, again, that's, that's very interesting because this is, these are questions that and many of architects and there's no point in our architectural education, if you like, where we discuss the different types of funding a developer might be going through, whether it's bridging finance, mezzanine finance, equity funding, yeah. all those sorts of things. These are, you know, not, not spoken about. And as soon yeah. as you start you know, have any kind of confidence to to be engaging with a developer um, and speaking that language with them already, you've distinguished yourself from 80, 90% of other architects. Exactly. Yeah. Out there. And, you know, I think that mo- more and more architectural curriculum would have two elements. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is communication, both spoken and written. Yeah. Uh, because we spend a lot of time on emails. And in many cases, first communication is via email. And mm-hmm. how do you make a strong impact with like written communication is very yeah. important. And especially in, in our current environment, when we are uh, so used to texting, and it's a very casual, colloquial way of texting, uh, whereas in a 
email, you know, it has to be framed and worded slightly differently. And then the other thing is just, you know, basics of business, understanding how to read a balance sheet and mm-hmm. just, just some of the basics. I think if, if uh, architecture curriculums have a little more of those two elements, it would be a huge help to students. Um, just talking specifically now about some of your industrial clients and your, 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 your working with, if I get this right, um, uh, well, I, I saw on one of the projects uh, medical marijuana was being grown. So it's kind of very interesting, um, innovative industries or new emerging industries, um, highly process driven clients. And I suspect that many of your clients are multi headed other corporate entities. Um, how do you, what are some of the sort of specialist ways of working with that type of client has Nelson developed or that, you know, you, you need to be aware of? Yeah. So, um, you know, in some cases we might be doing just the building shell and somebody mm-hmm. else comes in and does the inside. Um, so within the industrial sector, there are some specialized labs and manufacturing and cold storage facilities where we may not do the whole thing. We, we may, uh, we may do, you know, like the building and, and, and the skin, and then somebody else will come in and do the inside. Um, so some of that depends on, uh, what, what kind of expertise we have, um, and what, what the project demands. And in some cases we'll pair up with like specialty consultants to kind of help deliver those really specialized components of a project. Right. And, and, in, and in terms of dealing with a kind of complex client entity in itself, um, I mean, I know from my experience working with infrastructure clients and you're dealing with, a, a, you know, and they're multi-headed and it's different teams of different people and this can become quite a coordination exercise in itself. Um, yeah. what, what sorts of insights have, have you developed broadly speaking around just communicating with a, with a multifaceted client like that? Yeah. So some of that depends on who we are contracted under, you know, because let's say right. for a project, if we contracted with the owner versus a developer uh, who might be, you know, like a four fee developer who has been hired by the owner, um, or in some cases we might be under a general contractor, you know? Uh, so there are pros and cons to each one of those. Uh, but who we are contracted under uh, does set a tone for what the expectations uh, will be, you know, for uh, for our team. Um, so, uh, in you know, let's say uh, in some cases we we might be working for a owner on a certain project where we are contracted under a developer. Right. And and the developer brings us to the table for certain expertise. But on another project, we might be working directly with the owner and there mm-hmm. the expectations are completely different. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it just depends from project to project. I'm not sure, Ryan, if I answered your question there. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's 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 but that's very insightful. We're just trying to under, uh, under the, you know, what you're saying is the relationship, actually, of how you're directly connected with the end user or the client. Yes. Makes a big it matters. Impact. Yeah. It really matters. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, out of interest, obviously you were born and raised in, in India. Um, yep. Has your career taken you back there? Have you done much work in recent times in India or is, is this? Um, not in the last decade. Um, I, so after my undergrad uh, in India, I did work in India for a very short time, but mm-hmm. most of my professional, or in fact, all of my professional uh, experiences here in the U.S. You know. um, the first architectural firm I worked for in the U.S., I did go back to India for, uh, for work from time to time. This was in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, and uh but yeah but not in the last decade brilliant uh, do, do you remember or can you recall any major differences between how the arch- how the industries differ in in the different places oh yeah it's, it's day and night <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh you know i think um uh I'm not sure how how the industry has evolved in, in the India in the last ten years because I, I really haven't done any projects there. But um, my my past experience was that it was um, 
less structured and organized uh, as as compared to uh, what we have here in the U.S. You know, the the uh, Indian building code was just coming about in mm-hmm. like the 2000s. Um, uh, so yeah, so it was. Um, I think the the um, at at a design level, it was great, but on the execution level, is where it uh, where it kind of fell short in India. I would say it's complicated. Yeah. Does Does Nelson do any projects in in other in the other practices in India? And uh, you know, I don't know if we if we have done any projects in India or not. Honestly, I'm I'm not that involved with the international uh, work at Nelson, so I I I really can't comment on that. Mm-hmm. Great, fantastic, brilliant. So, what's what's planned for the rest of twenty twenty two? Well, it's um, you know it's it's growing the industrial practice in a meaningful way, attracting right kind of talent. Mm-hmm. Um, as you know, um, the labor market is very tight right now, so finding finding the right kind of people with right skill set and right mindset and attitude is is most important. You know, I I always tend to hire for attitude and train for skill. Mm -hmm. Uh, So um, yeah, so we are, we're growing rapidly uh, looking for talent at all levels of the organization. Our clients are growing. So making sure that uh, the work we take on with our clients, we, we can deliver at the right level. No. And um, industrial uh, is, is a very rapidly growing practice right now, specifically in certain parts of the U.S. You know, there are certain corridors in the south, southeast, and certain corridors on the east coast. Um, so we want to make sure that we are part of that growth. And um, you, you mentioned there about the, the the constraints that the industry is facing around attracting and, and hiring talent. How do you go about that at Nelson? How how are you? How have you been navigating some of those constraints, and how do you normally attract talent? Yeah, so so it's kind of like a multi prong approach, mm-hmm. you know, through our existing Nelson teammate network. That's that's kind of like the best best way to recruit, I would say. You know, mm-hmm. uh, if you work here and you have a friend who's looking, bring that friend over. You know. Um, uh, we we work with uh, local schools and and the universities, you know. So uh, staying in touch uh, touch with their professional placement uh, offices. Uh, we also work with uh, outside recruiters from time to time for certain strategic hires. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a multi prong approach. And um, in a large organization like ours with multiple offices, the strategy may differ from office to office or from region to region based on what is happening there. <coughs> Do you often find uh, is there a lot of movement between teams of employees? So, you know, someone who's been involved in the industrial practice for a while, is, is it easy for them to move over into one of the other practices in within Nelson? And does that happen quite a lot? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say that is one of the huge advantages of being in in like a 700 plus firm like ours with uh, eight or nine different practice areas mm-hmm. is uh, if you want to try out something new, you don't have to leave Nelson, you can m- move to another practice, you know, and the last two years of the pandemic has uh, taught us really well as to how we can work effectively uh, remotely, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so location has become less and less important, you know, I mean, like has become less and less important, yeah. uh, as long as the person has, has the discipline, uh, to, uh, to kind of monitor himself or herself, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it is easy to work from, for almost, uh, from almost anywhere, I would say. Um, so yeah, so the, it, it is, um. It, it is quite common in Nelson for somebody to uh, move from one practice to the other after one, two or three years, you know, if they want to try it, something new. Um, so, yeah, we do that quite often. Brilliant. Love it. Well, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation there, um, Balmiki. Thank you so much for giving that 
wonderful insight into how Nelson is structured your your career path and 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 the qualities of of what it takes to be a great leader so thank you very much great thank you so much for having me Ryan and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information if you enjoyed today's show please head on over to itunes and leave us a review i read every single one also I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.